for being here this afternoon. Um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Jedida Eisler, who is our CFA colloquium speaker for this afternoon. So Jedida is someone who will be very well known to a number of you here, having been a visitor at the CFA multiple times, which has been a great relief to me because when she's needed to go off to 160 Concord, she's been able to navigate herself there and not rely on me for that. Um, so Jedida received her PhD from um, Yale, a PhD in astrophysics, and in the process became the first uh, female African-American uh, to receive this uh, degree from uh, Yale. Uh, after that, she had postdoctoral stints at Syracuse, where she was a Chancellor's Fellow. And during this time, uh, she was also uh, affiliated with the Harvard Future Faculty Leaders uh, Fellowship Program. Um, and then going on from there, she then went on to Vanderbilt University, where she was an NSF uh, Fellow and is now a faculty member at Dartmouth. Um, so her research, which you will hear a lot more of uh, in the next hour or so, is uh, basically comprises the use of multi-wavelength observations to understand essentially the emission of jets from uh, very sort of active, powerful black holes, the so-called blazars. And uh, I suppose more, almost more importantly than that, uh, she's a great advocate for um, you know, uh, increasing both the diversity and equity um, status in the context of academia um, and uh, basically promoting uh, uh, women uh, of color and um, you know uh, other sort of marginalized um, groups uh, in STEM and this sort of advocacy has led to her being uh, nominated as a TED senior fellow uh, as well and uh, without much further ado I will let you uh, carry on. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming, specifically those of you who have Chandra deadlines. I appreciate your time. Tess's deadline is today, too. That's what I was just doing with my time. Uh, so thank you for coming. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, today, I am going to talk about high cadence simultaneous observations of blazars. Uh, and I looked at the colloquia schedule, and I noticed that there weren't very many talks on blazars. So we're going to spend a little time talking about it and make sure that we all know what we're talking about. And then we're going to blow that all up and ask for something different. So that's what I'm hoping to do with this talk. Uh, so let's get started. So this is an image from NASA. It's actually a Fermi image. It's pretty old, but I love it. And it shows a bunch of different, blaze, mostly blazars, that are actually just going off in gamma rays. And I just think it's a remarkable image that in very high energy, you can see these sources. Some of them are very familiar to you um, that are just just going off in time. So part of what makes blazars so interesting is that they are highly variable. Uh, and they are varying at high energies. Really, they're varying at almost all energies except the lowest energy radio. Um, but it's a really interesting uh, source to be looking at. So if you focus on any one of them, you'd notice it's going off and on at any given time, which I think is really pretty interesting. So for me, that's what makes them exciting. So let's talk about where we're going here. Um, the first thing is why blazars are even important in the scientific context, which is one of the worst questions to ask. They're, everything is innately interesting because we're inquisitive beings. Um, but specifically as it relates to particle acceleration, like how do we better understand or how do we use blazars as laboratories to better understand particle acceleration? Uh, from my perspective, I'm interested in the observational side. I have been talking to awesome colleagues about the uh, theoretical side and we're hoping to make some magic happen there. Uh, but I'm specifically interested in trying to understand and constrain uh, particle acceleration and where exactly you get the highest energy accelerations uh, in blazars observationally. Um, I'm also interested in the production of gamma rays, which I was having a very spirited conversation about today. Um, I am going to come from the perspective that in at least flat spectrum radio quasars, you get, in, uh, you get uh, the production of gamma, gamma rays by inverse Compton scattering. So that's what we're going to come from. I know that there are models and scenarios that suggest uh, self-synchrotron radiation, and I think that that is an important um, acceleration mechanism in some cases. But for this one, we're going to use that. Oh, I just told you something I wanted to tell you later. Uh, and then we're going to do two tests. We're going to basically try to understand the spectral variability in blazars in the context of high cadence data. So we're going to try to bathe ourselves in as much information as we can and see if that is reconciled with what we think we understand. 
Uh, and then we're going to look at where the location of this gamma emitting region, that is to say where the highest energy emission is produced in these relativistic jets. So we want to know how they accelerate particles. We want to know where that happens. Um, and then we're going to basically throw it out. We're going to see if it's time for us to make a different set of assumptions about the very simple models that we have that have gotten us very far, um, but probably are, it's time for uh, an upgrade. All right, so what makes blazars really good at being a particle accelerator detector? This image on my left, your right, I guess I should move out the way, is uh, from Ann Worley's work. It shows the centimeter emission from, I think it's 3273, uh, from way back in 2001. And what you can see is, well, the paper's published then. Uh, you can see that in 1992, there was this stationary core that's hanging out very bright. Uh, and as time progressed, you have emission from the core that seems to be moving out in time, which makes sense. And on the x-axis, I'm showing you distance and light years. Um, a quick bit of math will show you, will, will in, identify for you that in six years' time, it looks like, say, this source has gone uh, 20 light years, which is a little bit of a problem. Um, <laughs> I wasn't going to make that joke here because y'all all know the physics, but if you're going to laugh. Um, yeah, so this is apparent superluminal motion. Um, it was one of those things where either Einstein had to be wrong or we were missing something. We all know that that means we were missing something. And what we were missing was an understanding about what angle on line of sight particles were moving and how fast they had to be moving and what that would do to how we view them from where we are. That's basically what it is. It's a, it's a cosmic... Uh, optical illusion. So you've got particles that are moving basically at the speed of light, just under, say, 99.99% of the speed of light, uh, and they're almost at your angle on line of sight. And so the particles are moving almost as fast as the emission, the radiation they're producing. And so you get sort of a buildup in signal. It's so similar to the Doppler effect that we call it Doppler boosting, although it's not quite exactly the same. Um, and it's because of the same things that you know. These are equations that I am suspecting you see where it, it's based on the apparent speed of the particles and the angle, the angle on line of sight. Uh, you then get your Lorentz factor and lo and behold, you come up with this Doppler factor. We usually call it the Doppler beaming factor, which is based on those three parameters. So basically, the closer a relativistic particle, usually we assume electrons, but whatever relativistic particle, is to your line of sight, um, if it is able to copiously produce radiation, that radiation, first of all, number one, will be um, directed more closely to your line of sight, but you will also see it apparently moving faster than it should be. Geometric effect. Um, the reason why this is important, actually, is because it makes blazars very, very bright and their time scale of variability is very short. So you can basically see them anywhere. Almost every survey observes blazars, which for blazar astrophysicists is fantastic. I know for some others, you consider it contamination. We can agree to disagree about that. But it does mean that if you have a, a survey and it can pick up any electrons, I mean, sorry, any, any radiation, you're going to see blazars. So this is why blazars are the best, one of the best, we'll say, uh, particle acceleration laboratories. So we think we understand what the class of blazars is. Um, it is related to active galactic nuclei. And according to the unified model, we think what that means is that all AGN, anything that has an active galactic nucleus, is basically the same set of pieces. Uh, we can, we should be talking about the fact that this model is probably oversimplified in terms of like each of the components. But let's just say that there is, well, we know there's some supermassive black hole in the center. And we've got some accretion disk of some phenomenology. I would argue that it's probably more complicated with this. I know others would too. Uh, and then you've got a torus and in blazars you've got this relativistic jet um, that is uh, close on angles to line of sight, less than, than 5 to 10 degrees. And in addition, there's this other material that uh, classically we think about as uh, gas and Keplerian motion, but it's probably, it probably has to be more complicated than that. Uh, but there are all these pieces that are, we think, consistent in all sources. But if you want to understand the jet, then you take sources for which the jet is pointed at you, and then you infer that all these other things exist. That's, the, that's the, the unified model of AGN. But the thing is, if you've got this high intensity radiation, uh, and it's amplified in your direction, then it's probably going to dominate all the emission that you see, which is true. 
Um, blazars are bright everywhere. I just said this. Now I'm showing you a plot so that I, you can believe it. Um, and it's also, so this is luminosity and solar luminosities, but it's 10 to the 12 solar luminosities. They're really, really bright um, all the way across the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and so you basically want to understand how does this jet produce such radiation across the electrical magnetic spectrum. We think we understand how that works. Um, and so let's talk about it. On the low frequency side, we think that's actually pretty much agree that that's due to synchrotron radiation, relativistic synchrotron radiation, right? So that makes sense. You've got these elect electrons, they're accelerating in a magnetic field, maybe some protons too, um, that are accelerating in a magnetic field and they produce synchrotron radiation. In the inverse Compton model, your high energy peak is then due to inverse Compton scattering of those electrons on some photon bath. Um, my assumption is that that photon bath is probably the broadline region. We can argue about whether it's the torus or some other one, maybe it's self-produced. Uh, but in any case, there has to be some bath of photons that are colliding with these electrons and being upscattered to higher energies. If that model is true, then these two peaks must necessarily be related. They must be causally related because it's basically one population producing a thing and bouncing off another. And so the two peaks should basically go up and down together. So that's actually a really simple test that we did very early in the Fermi era, era to um, actually measure how often these two peaks were correlated. Turns out they are um, highly correlated most of the time. As with most things, uh, as we've looked, it's been about 10 years, more than 10 years since Fermi has launched, we're starting to see structure in this relationship. The correlations are starting to be questioned more deeply. Um, but ultimately, the first order, they do seem to correlate, which means that there has to be at least some inverse Compton scattering happening. Um, blazars can be uh, assumed to create a sequence. Uh, where you have jet power uh, that is inversely proportional with the peak of the synchrotron emission. Uh, they call it the blazar sequence. There's a lot of work um, that has been done, um, and it's been updated over time. But effectively, it's just really just to say that there are flavors of blazars. Um, it depends on what area or what arena you're thinking about. Um, the easiest way for, say, an observationalist to think about it is that there are flat spectrum radio quasars, which basically have very luminous disks, very powerful jets. They're the red ones in this case. Um, they are, they have a strong broadline region, which is reprocessed by the disk. And so you would expect that um, they would have emission lines from this broadline region because it's reprocessed emission. BLAC objects are um, less powerful, um, tend to be bluer, as you see, um, and are probably starved in terms of their disk. If they have a disk, it's severely underluminous, um, and they probably don't. They're very gas poor. So you would expect that they likely do not have uh, a broadline region to speak of. Uh, and it's true. If you look at the optical spectra of a BLAC, it's mostly a power law. There is nothing really interesting going on, which as a consequence, it's an aside, but as a consequence, it means that you can't actually constrain its, their redshifts as well as flat spectrum radio quasars. Um, that's just bonus information. Um, so, as I mentioned before, so how do you produce these gamma rays? Um, I think it comes from inverse Compton scattering. Uh, from electrons, and I think that that process is dominant, at least in quasars, because you have this very rich photon bath that is the accretion disk, and so it just lends itself to um, upscattering in, in any number of ways. You could also go a little bit further out, have slightly lower energy photons, and be considering um, the torus. But in any case, I think it does come from this thermal component um, that is relatively nearby. Uh, in point of fact, the, the broadline region We'll talk about the models that we use for this, but at least at this point, the canonical models suggest that they're about 0.1 parsecs from the central source, so they're very close. Um, and the torus is a little further out from that. Uh, but basically, that's how they form. But uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, folks were thinking about, OK, well, if you had inverse Compton scattering as a dominant process, uh, how would that interact with, say, the broadline region? So this model down here is actually called the mirror model. And the idea is that if you, as you have these electrons moving through the jet, that they encounter this very thin spherical layer that is the broadline region. Some of those um, gamma ray photons Nope. Some of those relativistic electrons are coming through the jet and will interact with the BLR and then bounce light back, right? So you have this direct interaction. Here, you have an argument for how much energy density for each component in your system you would have at a given distance from your central source. So as you can see, when you're very close to the central source, you have a bunch of different uh, 
energy producers. Uh, you have disk energy, you have uh, stuff from the Taurus IR, uh, you have the broadline region, but as you get further out, uh, the sources of ener energy density fall. And so you really, there are, there are specific <clears throat> regions that favor, say, BLR photons, for example, or Taurus photons, uh, just by argument of how those structures are modeled at time. And I want to put a flag there that it matters a lot how you model each one of these components as to where you, how far you expect their energy density to be dominant. Hmm. You seen there's going to be a movie, but whatever. There's one more thing I wanted to say was that um, the, the other simplest way that we think about this is that the emission that's produced that creates these these jets is one zone. That means you just have basically a plasma blob that's moving relativistically through the jet. It interacts in its current sort of one. Um, one spatial uh, model, and then that moves out through, and that's that's the origin of the flares. You can get way more compli complicated than that, and you really should, but just keep in mind that that's what these models are based on. They're one zone, uh, and they're based on inverse Compton scattering. Okay, so then what we're really trying to do is understand how this jet is produced in a system where there's a bunch of photons and a lot of stuff going on uh, in a way that is self-consistent. This is actually work by Alan Marshall at BU um, where they're talking about, a, this is actually a specific model has to do with uh, shocks and magnetic reconnection. But the idea is to figure out in, in this sort of morass of things happening, what actually is causing this jet. And furthermore, to be fair, is it the same all the time? Like if it's a stochastic process, it's not periodic in any way, then should we assume that it's always the same thing? If it's a shock, yes, but if it's not, then you know, there, there are just, there's just room for, for questions. So uh, what I was thinking about and based on who I was working with and what resources we had available, we said, well, if you could observe Blazar simultaneously, because right, the simultaneous part is important to figure out if those two peaks are going up and down together. Uh, so if you could observe across the EM spectrum simultaneously, you would be the most powerful person in the world, but we can't do that. So instead, let's go for the most energetically relevant portions of the SED and see if that can tell us something. So that's what we did. We basically looked at the SED and we focused in on the places where you had the most energetic um, behaviors. The first place is down at the low energy end. Um, it turns out that for flat spectrum radio quasars, you get most of your emission in the optical infrared. Many studies have been done, some of them we did, that talked about how um, you expect for that kind of, um, for this kind of emission, that the blueward side of your peak is going to be the most variable. So we just picked where is most variable because we wanted to see what's going on. Uh, and then it was, it, it's, I mean, almost impossible not to do Blazar work with Fermi. So we looked at Fermi and tried to compare the variability in low energy frequencies and the variability in high energy frequencies, first to see if they correlate, but also second, just to see um, what the variability does. So that leads me to my first experiment. What is the nature of the spectral variability in Blazars? So I said this thing about um, expecting coast, uh, correlated variability, um, but you have to really test that thing. So we did, um, and it turns out that, like I said, for the most part, they do vary. Um, but what I wanted to look at was particularly um, what in the optical infrared band happened to the color of the source. So I wanted to know. Uh, it's important because obviously the color is just another way to me measure spectral index. So it tells me if the peak is shifting at all, um, what the shape of it is, if it, that changes with flares. So that's what I looked at. Um, but it's important to know what we were up against. So this is, you're going to see this a couple of times, so I'll just explain it. Uh, you're looking at the color, and this is optical infrared. It's actually B minus J to be specific, Johnson cover, Johnson cousins, B minus J to be specific, uh, where the bottom is blue, the top is red. Uh, and then this is versus J band magnitude. And I use J band magnitude as a proxy for the jet uh, because generally the infrared is just as contaminated with the disk, uh, sorry, with the jet emission as um, the higher energy bands. And so I wanted to get as redward as I can to get much more contamination from the non-thermal components uh, than to have uh, more contamination from the disk. So I wanted the non-thermal emission. So 
The Blazar Canon says that flat spectrum radio quasars with their very luminous disks um, are generally going to get redder when they get brighter because you really have two global pieces of your system competing with each other. The disk is very blue, it's very luminous, doesn't vary very much. because It's big, it's massive, nothing really happens to it. Except on small scales, we can talk about that too. Um, but the jet, when it comes on, is highly transient and very red in the optical infrared band or in the, op in the infrared band to be particular, but in the optical infrared band. So you expect that you've got this transient component coming up from the red, uh, sitting on top of a, a disc that's blue. And so you get sort of a redder and brighter because the disc, sorry, the jet is be beamed. So it's gonna overtake the luminosity of the disc very quickly, and the disc is not. So not only is the disc not moving or not variable, but it's also um, not beamed. So you would expect that this is really just the global behavior of the system. Uh, whereas BLAC objects would be bluer and brighter. Number one, they have no disk. Uh, so that any electrons that you're accelerating along the jet axis would attain higher energies, than going faster, bluer, before they would actually dissipate by colliding with whatever they collide with farther out. So you just expect a bluer system. There's less uh, for it to be fighting with. Um, and for a long time, this is sort of the framework that we used um, when thinking about the optical infrared colors of blazars. The issue with that is that BLX and FSRQs are actually just different. They're in the same family. They have the similar sort of phenomenology, but they are different. They have different jet powers. They have different disk luminosities. Um, the, the, the behavior of any sort of gas or thermal component is very different. So to take two sets of objects at their most extreme, that is to say when they're flaring, and then compare them to each other will exacerbate any differences between them. It's a selection effect because they're different and then you're looking at them when they're most different, right? So when we take blazar observations, which we do, it's fantastic. When something goes off, the whole world will go and look at a blazar. So you have this multi-wavelength imaging of the blazar, but it's only during, it's mostly during the time when it's flaring. That means to say that you get these effects because you're watching at a time when they're very different. My guess was that if we, so I just want to show this image, which is a different band, but shows you sort of the complex structure of things moving out. It's also a different scale, but uh, it sort of uh, demonstrates what I was trying to say about how much stuff is happening here. Uh, so my idea or my guess was that if we just looked all the time, so not just when it was flaring, but just at all times, you might recognize what the color variability is in all states, and maybe it's not that different, maybe it is, who knows, but you just would get more information if you looked at um, more bands. So that's what we did. We asked the question, um, is color variability in the optical infrared in particular uh, that simple? And the answer to that question is universally no, it's never that simple. There are always complications. Uh, the two complications that I mentioned are one, time scales. Um, if, if you have color variability and you're assigning that variability specifically to a transient jet, then you're already making a statement about how long you think that variability should last. But if you're only watching it when it's flaring, then you can never disprove whether or not it's due to the jet. So let's just watch it at all times when it's actually flaring, and by flaring I really do mean in gamma rays, um, and let's watch it when it's not and let's see what the color does. Uh, and then the second thing is, like I said, the uh, spectral coverage. Most of the studies that have done this in the past um, have done it in sort of narrow bands. So you could do it, uh, people have done V minus R, people have done um, V minus U. Nope, that's not right. V minus I, I think that's right. Uh, and mostly based, I is not, but mostly based in the optical. What I was trying to do is figure out if there were any way to see over that, S that synchrotron peak and see what the IR was doing. So I wanted to extend not just the temporal co coverage, but also the wavelength coverage to see what additional information, if any, we could get. So this is like eight or nine years of data. At the top, you're looking at the Fermi light curve uh, for 3C279. In the second panel, you're looking at the color, B minus J color that I measured. Uh, then there's just B and J so that you can see it. Uh, and what you can, we're not going to talk about the dotted lines for this particular talk, um, but what I want to first point out is that the color does vary with time. Uh, and it's not clear that every time the color varies, there is some flare in the gamma rays. So 
even before we've done any real analysis, it's important to know that there is some driver of color variability that um, is worth thinking about that is not just related to a flaring state. So now I'm going to show you all the data for this same time uh, plotted as color versus magnitude. Um, and this is what it looks like. So your, the colored points are the actual date. Um, I've marked some of them here so you can see where they are. Uh, and then it's just the B minus J that I told you. The first thing I want you to see is it's complicated. It, it is complicated. It is not the case that because this source is a flat spectrum radio quasar that it is universally going to be in a redder when brighter state. That is not true. Um, it is also not true that there is some coherent um, behavior that you can necessarily um, just looking at the data infer. So, oh, and the other thing that is important to note is that if you were doing, let's say you got time on, not going to say any names of telescopes, that's not a good idea. Um, let's say you got time on some optical telescope during this window. That's 200 days of data. Uh, it's the orange. In that case, you would say, and this, this day is going, um, it's coming down from red state going to blue. You would say that this source must have been, before you observed it, in a red state, uh, and that it is now cooling and turning blue, going back to its disk face. But if you then observed it in the yellow, I think that's this one, this one, yeah, then you would see a bluer when brighter state. So then we'd have an argument in the literature about how 3C279 is actually redder and brighter. No, it's bluer than brighter. And both of you would actually be right because it's possible for a source, if you watch long enough, to march through different color phases. But the question is, you haven't gotten rid of your jet. You haven't gotten rid of the disk. So what actually is happening? Uh, so what I did was I looked at these regions, and I should say they're mostly broken down by seasons. So this is smart data, it's ground-based, it's basically what I could observe at a time. I tried to keep it as wide as possible so as to not um, put in too many selection effects. So you should know that. I've broken it down into smaller parts. I'm going to show it for this talk. Um, and you can, you can think about different like micro events. But just to say this, I tried to parse it as little as possible. Uh, and then the black line is the average over the total um, light curve. So oh, on average over... Eight, eight years or so, uh, this source is bluer and brighter. So you could say that, but it would be a gross oversimplification to do so. So what we tried to do was think about all of what we, under, or what we think we understand about how blazars are formed and how the process works and try to build a model that would march along color space uh, in a way that is consistent with the data. So the first thing we, oh, and so what you'll see is little toy SCDs. I recognize that by putting actual bands, it does set what kind of source I'm looking at, but I really just wanted to do that so you'd have a frame of reference. It's a toy model. Um, so you've got a little SCD that's going to pop up in each corner, and then we'll walk through what the, um, the dominant source of luminosity is. So when a source is fairly faint and very blue, you expect it to be dominated by a disk. That is not new. Didn't make up anything there. Uh, I didn't make up anything at all. But in particular, this, is, this makes sense. It's consistent with what we think we understand for uh, a disk of this size. Once you have some sort of flaring event, for whatever reason, then you get an additional component. This is the global contribution of two sources with different spectral shapes that I was talking about earlier. In that case, you would expect to have some point, albeit briefly, where the disk luminosity and the jet luminosity are similar. It's super quick because the jet is beamed, but you would expect at some point there does have to be a crossover. In that case, you expect to see an increase in secretron flux because it's a jet. It's non-thermal emission, it's non-thermally dominated. So you expect to see an increase in synchrotron flux due to this additional component. Uh, and so you get redder, but also brighter. On the other hand, as that jet flare moves through your SED, it's just going to rise and move through your SED, you actually have swamped the disk. And so all you're looking at is jet emission. If you're having any additional particle acceleration events, then you would expect increasingly bluer spectra. So in that case, you're still going to be getting brighter because it's a jet event. It's flaring. Uh, but you expect it to be bluer and brighter. So this is a turnover in the change of how, in, in the behavior of the color um, in optical infrared. In this case, 
my suggestion is that maybe what we're looking at is actually individual particle acceleration events rather than global changes in the system. You've already gotten rid of effectively the disk emission, so you're really only looking at what's happening in the jet itself. Um, I expect that this really only happens once you've gotten past whatever your source's lo disk luminosity is. So I can't tell you, that's why I was saying the thing about uh, the spectrum, I can't tell you uh, what this value will be for a given source, it depends on the luminosity of the disk, but I can say that whatever, whenever you get to that, I expect some turnover in the shape. Um, and then the suspicion is that you can actually, so you can move back up and down here by just like accelerating electrons and then having those electrons radiatively cooling. But you can also move across, that is to say, keep the same color um, even though you're fading, if instead of the fact that you've like radiated away your energy in other photons, that you've basically just moved outside of the emission region itself. So you haven't lost your energy, so you haven't changed color, but you are no longer in the realm where you can be given any more energy. So you will then um, cool uh, a, a, yeah, you'll, you'll cool. So then my measure of interest becomes the sign of the slope. So if you have a negative slope, then you're on this side, you have a system where you're looking at global changes in the, in the disk and the jet. Um, and so you probably are just marching in between the addition of synchrotron flux and its dissipation. But then at some point later, you have a positive uh, slope, a positive value of the slope. Uh, and in that case, I suspect that you're really in a jet dominated phase. So I'm trying to use optical infrared color as a way to discriminate when you're in a, a part of the, of the system's evolution where you're looking just at the jet or in a part of the system's evolution where you're looking at both components. Okay. So that is what we think we understand about it. I want to stop and say that one of the important one of the important things to do is cross calibrate the data and the information in other bands or using other um, mechanisms. So one of the things that I have been thinking a lot about is optical polarization, right? Because again, if you've got this non-thermal emission, uh, you've got synchrotron radiation, you expect that to be polarized in some way. So I've been thinking a lot about polarization and thankfully others have too. So this is work by um, Kielman et al. in 2016. And I, there, they have a huge panel of all of the things, um, but I'm really only zooming in on these two where you're looking at the polarization angle and the sort of rotation of the polarization uh, with time. Um, and what was interesting about their work, and it sort of covers the same range as, as we did, uh, we did it completely independently, but was, what was different about their work was they basically tried to say that the polarization should also have more or less structure depending on what's happening with the jet. So they said, okay, well, in places where you have strong dilution by non-thermal emission, uh, you would expect that the, the polarization would be lower and probably more variable, uh, more um, unordered. Uh, they call that the stochastic process. Uh, and that is what they said was happening here, where in, you know, what we usually do is mark the, the angle with time. So we see a rotation, we say, oh, that must be some jet emission. What they're saying is, well, no, if you look at the actual sort of like behavior, the rate of change in this, this thing, it doesn't, it's not as convincing. Maybe that's a different phase. And then they looked at another rotation in the, in the polarization angle, um, and they noticed, well, here it is actually really well behaved. So maybe that's a deterministic place in the, in the um, evolution of the polarization, and maybe that's a place where you really are looking at um, an, an emission process happening on the jet side. So uh, I crossed my fingers and I looked at my data since we're using the same source, overlapping the same time, and I just went and I found where they, they marked these. I did not. Um, I went and found where this sits in my data. And it's the same circle, so the solid circle is the one where you had uh, stochastic processes. And lo and behold, it's up here in the part of the spectrum where you were in some red state and you're decreasing back. And the part where they saw this deterministic portion where you would expect, well, you could, uh, you could argue that you have some coherent thing happening in the jet. Um, I found that in the side of my um, color variability space that is bluer and brighter. So it's a first pass, uh, but it was really interesting to see that this completely independent way to find uh, the impact of non-thermal emission does seem to match with what we're doing. 
So this is not actually something in my talk, don't be scared. Um, but it is to say that we do have some more work to do on understanding color variability. Um, and that color variability is much more complicated than we make it. And it, you can only really start to distinguish what's happening uh, as you get more. So one of the things I'm doing now, um, in addition to teaching, is figuring out um, if this behavior is persistent with other sources in our sample. Like I said, we've got more than 100 of them. So really just trying to look and see what's happening there. So that's that. In a fun twist, I am actually going back to a question that I asked in graduate school about if we understand the location of the gamma emitting region in blazars. So um, the way that I do that is a similar kind of thing where I'm trying to understand where exactly is this process. Um, and the way that you could do it, is you could start to map and time, if you're doing it simultaneously, uh, if this lights up at the same time the jet lights up. That's what we're doing, uh, trying to understand that. And if you can if you can see some relationship between this thermal emission, and here I'm using loosely the, the notion that there's a broad line region in there. I'm not actually talking quite yet about the disk being the dominant um, em, uh, emission mechanism. But if I can say something about what happens with the broad line region luminosity, which is, after all, a tracer of the disk, then maybe I can say something about the spatial extent if I assume a simple model for the broad line region that is spherically shelled and subparsec scale. So it's a super simple model, but if I assume it, can I measure anything about it? So that's what we tried to do. We just went and we hammered one of the, what turns out to be one of the most famous <laughs> blazars Ever, well, at least in the Fermi era, 3C454.3, it's flat spectrum radio quasar. We hammered it. This is, uh, again, Fermi, uh, see, oh, nope, lies. Uh, this is the B band, J band, the synchrotron flux, and then Fermi at the bottom. Uh, and then the vertical lines are where you see, uh, where we took simultaneous optical spectra. So we tried to take it at different gamma ray states uh, so that we could get a sense of what's happening over time. What we found was that in cases where uh, the jet was basically very faint, so you're looking at the line flux versus the log of the line flux versus the gamma ray flux, in places where the jet was basically off, you have a mean line flux that is consistent with the mean. Uh, and you expect that because the broad line region actually really is photoionized mostly by the disk. So you expect it to be just humming along down there without any help. Uh, what was interesting uh, was that at high gamma ray flux, you started to see a marginally significant deviation from the mean. Uh, that was important because no one thought that that would happen. Everybody thought, well, you have this highly collimated jet. There's really no reason why this very distributed broadline region should have any impact from this highly collimated beamed. All of the emission is sort of focused out in, in front of you that you should have that. So just for funsies, I went and I plotted the color for this source. This is the same B minus J versus J. Uh, and I just plotted where we saw our marginal detections. And again, they show up at the on the redder one brighter portion of this, this diagram. Uh, I've plotted 3C454.3 like this basically for its entire Fermi life. And it is mostly very, it mostly stays in the redder one brighter phase. Sometimes it has a little bit of a turnover, but it never gets, um, even in its most um, active phases, doesn't get so far over into the blue one brighter phase. I, we were not the only ones that saw this. This is uh, the work by Leon Tavares. We did this work at the same time. This was based on Stewart data. Um, you're still looking at the magnesium, two, that was the magnesium two line. I don't think I said that a minute ago. Um, it's a magnesium two line. Here's a continuum. And they, what they add is eight millimeter flux. So basically they're, and the uh, cyan colors are where um, there were core ejections. So what they're saying is not only do they also see a variation in the emission line, but they also can map that to where there was a core ejection. Now, that's a different argument. We're talking with core ejections. We're talking about parsec scales, tens of parsec scales out. So we're, we're having a slightly different conversation. But in terms of the observations, we're both saying that there is some broad line variability that has to be accounted for in these blazar jets. So is there anything else? So these were the, these were the two um, groups that were doing this work at the time. So most of the work you'll see um, talking about whether or not broad line emission is variable or not will reference one of these two papers, which is an interesting thing because uh, that was in 2013. So there's still more work to be done, um, not to be too hard on us for doing it. But if you expect to see um, gamma rays produce 
I won't say deep in the broad line region, but like, well, I guess Putan and Stern did. So we'll say deep in the broad line region, then simultaneously, you must also account for the fact that those gamma rays are going to interact with the photon bath around them and they're going to gamma absorb, gamma gamma absorb, and you will get a deficit in the high energy um, regime actually in the Fermi band. And it depends on the photons that you're talking about, what their energy is. It's a very in, uh, energy dependent process, but it will happen. You should, if it's happening, if there is uh, gamma rays produced in the broad line region, you should see this deficit in high energy. Uh, so very early work tried to do this, um, and because there weren't enough photons, um, upper limits could be interpreted as uh, potentially the start of these um, absorption dips. Uh, over time, we found that that was not the case, and in fact, I'll get to that in just a second. But the idea is that one must lead the other. They have to be related, and so if you're going to go for this model, you have to account for the fact that there has to be this deficit, um, which um, this was a more recent one, but still not enough. Uh, data in 2014. The other thing that argues for this sort of near field um, broad emission line, um, I don't know why I said it that way, this near field dissipation model would be that there's fast variability in blazars, like six hour time scale variability. And it's really hard to do that very far out in a jet that's not highly collimated. It's just hard to do. It's not impossible. Uh, in fact, um, groups have done it, but it's, it's hard to do and it's not always clear that it's the elegant solution. Uh, to borrow from this afternoon's conversation. But at the same time, I showed you uh, broadline luminosity, broadline variability that was also uh, related to a core ejection that's at tens of parsec scales. Can't get rid of that. And in fact, if you look at millimeter data, um, you often see that there is, while the variability time scale is longer, it's not as uh, sharp in its uh, variation, there you do see an increase in the millimeter flux. Uh, at the same time, you see an increase in the gamma ray flux. And so that is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and we really, we know very well where these core ejections are. They're, they are very well constrained, highly um, resolved. And so figuring out how to reconcile these two things um, is an important question, but the ultra-fast variability is sort of an issue for this. So um, Alan Marsher over at BU came up with this uh, turbulent emission mechanism and where it's, well, it's actually turbulent extreme multi-zone model. Uh, and the idea was that if you just took, instead of having this real simple um, single zone emission, if you took a blob and had it have different cells of turbulent emission, then each one of those cells is small enough to produce fast variability and they wouldn't all be lit up at the same time as they go through the shock. So you would have very small emission mechanisms in this larger turbulent thing, right? So that can do the work. It's not clear that it fills all the gaps, but it is possible to do. Um, and lastly, you can model it in other ways, you can model it with synchrotron self-radiation, a self-confidentization. Um, you can model it with a strong um, hadronic um, emission process. So it's not clear that there's one single solution to fitting the SED. So it's important to note that. And then more recently, uh, Custamente et al. in 2018 did a um, very large study of the gamma, gamma re region of hundreds of blazars. Uh, and what they found was that now that we have enough statistics, we don't see this deficit in the SED that would be because of this gamma gamma absorption if it were due to um, the deep in the broad line region. So we have to think about what that means uh, while also accounting for the fact uh, that it, oh, and the other cases that it's not clear that every source shows this broad line region variability, which to be fair, it's like I said earlier, it's not clear that all flares are from the same sort, uh, sorry, from the same physical reason. Uh, so it, it's not clear that you would get it for all of those things. So basically, we understand that we see broad line variability. Everybody agrees that we've seen it. The question is, what does it mean? What is causing it? Um, is it just the fact that you've got some um, variability in the disk that just happens to be aligned with what you saw? Um, if you're going to have it and it's gonna, you're going to have this broad line region interacting with the jet, then necessarily you're going to have this gamma gamma absorption. It looks like it doesn't work, but I just will underline again that this is highly model dependent, which is where we're going next. You do that really quickly. Um, and that you can actually model fast variability anywhere. Um, given enough knobs to turn. So I basically want, the one thing that we can all agree on right now is that 
there must be some interaction with the thermal um, component in some cases. So we did all that talking and it's still unclear um, where the gamma emitting region is, if it, it varies over time, if it's constant in a source, if, if is it standing shock or not. All of these questions are, um, are things we're still thinking about, but my answer would be it's complicated. We don't yet know. We're finally getting to the place where we have high resolution enough data, enough photon statistics to really start to make a distinguishing case. And I would argue that the first place we should start, and I know that I have um, comrades in the room that agree with this, but is that we have to start with the fact that our theory of what the broad line region is, is really simple. And that's fine, it's a great place to start, but there's no reason to think that this is actually what the thing looks like. Um, it, it just, I, I, I don't wanna uh, poo poo any models. I just wanna say that it might be a good time for us to think about things like the composition, orientation, and extent of the broadline region, given what we know about a stratified BLR and such. And so with my last few minutes, I wanted to just think about some of the models, even the ones that are here, which I really like, um, that suggest a dynamic broadline region, that maybe what you've got is a disk that is uh, puffy and there's gas that's cold and hot and do well, warm and doing all the things, and maybe you've got stuff that's bubbling up from the disk and over time it loses its ability to, to be buoyant and it falls back down, this so-called quasar rain that um, Marnell was came up with. Uh, if that's the case, you would expect, first of all, it's a much more complicated process with many more components than we've looked at before, and also we would expect some dynamical signatures because you have literal clouds moving through your broadline region. That's an important thing. There are other models which I won't go into in the interest of time, but my point is to say that like, as you think about like what uh, construction uh, your disk and, and broadline region look like, how close or far they are from each other, all of that matters and, and, and has a very real impact on what you expect the responses to be. So anyway, they're, they're great models. Uh, so, um, well, let me just push back through that. Anyway, so basically what we, what we did in 2013 with Stewart and Smarts was prove that there is at least some hint of variability. Um, we can argue about where that variability is coming from and what it means, but at least it exists. Um, but we really need more information. This is, both of them are two meter class instruments. Uh, so really you need more um, resolution here. Uh, and that's what I'm arguing that we use a bigger spectral polarimeter, put them both together, um, and find a way to actually measure more than just the line flux variation. Let's measure the line profile, let's measure the wings, let's actually get a sense of dynamics because if you have a dynamical broadline region, you need to see signatures of dynamics in the wings. And so let's get a set of um, observations that will let us do that. Uh, and then even the models for the simplest of broadline regions are getting better with time. Uh, folks are still working on that. So I think it's time to re-up the schedule, um, sorry, the system. Here is an AGN, it's not a blazar, but it shows uh, proof of concept of what I'm talking about. So you've got uh, a line varying, you, get, you have lots of resolution on the sides, uh, and you can start to decompose what the variation is uh, in those wings and potentially where the centroid is changing, all of the fun moments of uh, line fitting that you wanna do, but there are, there's enough statistics, there's high enough resolution for you actually to be able to do that. Um, I'm at Dartmouth now, so I'm using SALT to do this. Um, which is convenient, it's Q-observed, and I can get very good resolution on Southern Hemisphere sources. This works out for me in a cosmic way because SMARTS was in the South, so a lot of the hundred or so sources I've been looking at there, I can extend the baseline a little further, get a little more information. Um, this is Stephanie Pudgett, who's helping me do this work. She's a first year graduate student learning how to reduce spectropolarimetry data, so uh, pray our strength, um, although she's awesome and doing a great job. So uh, maybe with my last minute, I will say that what I'm thinking about in the future, in, a, in, in addition to trying to push forward and make slightly more sophisticated our understanding of the dynamics of the broadline region and complicating our notions of um, how it can impact the, the jet in this case, uh, is, is thinking about blazars less as um, 
things we look at when they're bright and shiny and more getting into the framework where we're looking at things for statistical value. Um, that's where I'm trying to go next. That's why if you were at, I'm going to skip this for a little. You can ask me about this in a little bit. Um, okay. Uh, if you were here at lunch, you heard me ask about machine learning. Uh, it's because I think that's the direction we have to go. That and astrostatistics, I know they're separate and they're both very important. We can continue doing the boutique Blazar studies. I think they're important when they're bright and interesting. Let's point everything at them, of course, but let's not turn away when the flare ends. Let's keep looking and see what's happening and then recognize that there already is a tremendous data set that exists to do that. So one of the things that we're trying to think about now is um, doing what I like to call precision Blazar astrophysics. So trying to get much more specific about what is happening uh, in these sources given the vast data set that exists. So those are the kinds of things I'm thinking about as I'm transitioning into this role. Uh, last but not least, these are sort of my conclusions that um, they're an incredible laboratory. You really do need high cadence, simultaneous, and multi-wavelength data to really do it um, justice. Uh, and that color variability can't be a simple interplay between global properties. Uh, and that the broad line region is probably a lot more complicated than we think it is. Uh, and that really, if we're going to do this, we've got to trade off a little bit of the boutique observations for a statistical analysis. I'm going to leave this here just in case you didn't see it at lunch, and I am here to answer your questions. Yeah. Uh, and for us, it's Bloor when, uh, sorry, Bloor when Bloor mm -hmm. with uh, disk emission versus jet emission. Mm -hmm. And should we expect trends with... Uh, uh, observing angle uh, to the source, and should we also expect trends with the expected jet Lorentz factor? That's yes. one question. I'm going to yes. ask another question soon. Okay. Oh, you want? Oh, okay. yeah, so what, yeah. Yes, you should. So, um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately um, is exactly that point that, like, you should expect trends specifically in jet angle. We know that, which is related to the Doppler factor, right? Like, those things are inextricably linked. Um, so, I would expect to see. Uh, that those things change over time. And to be honest with you, that's something that I have to do. Um, I, I'm not, I don't do radio galaxies very often, even though I know that's a very important mission. Uh, so I need to think about that thing, but yes, I do expect trends. Yeah, and probably uh, there, with a smaller angles to the line of sight, maybe a higher fraction of the time would be spent in the jet dominated phase. For so I think, I think you have to also include the fact that like it's not just that there is a jet, it's that that jet is also powerful, right? Because part, yeah, yeah. so part, part of the thing, yeah, yeah. So part of the thing you run into it when you get off angle is that you're also just looking at a different population of sources that have less power. So yes, as long as we can keep, we're, we're really sure that our parent population off axis is the same. That is to say, that you're looking at radio galaxies, then yeah, I think you can do this. And and yours just a little um, uh, boost for the. Uh, Supertron self Compton versus uh, uh, Compton. So, uh, with the inverse Compton, we're kind of, uh, when we're trying to explain variability, and uh, we, we, we only kind of have uh, uh, emission that's pretty much linear in the soft photon density, whereas in synchrotron self Compton, it's a more nonlinear process. So, it seems like maybe there's more room to take advantage mm -hmm. of. Uh, of, uh, of just the way that the emission physics uh, lets us get some, you can contrive more examples with, uh, with the ra or some examples with rapid variability mm -hmm. by taking advantage of, of, of the nature of uh, soft Compton versus. Uh, yeah, and to be Compton. fair, to be fair, like there are many sources, often VLX or high synchrotron peak sources, for which self synchrotron works perfectly. Like, it's not that that model doesn't work. I don't want to leave you with that. It's just, I'm saying that I, don't think it works universally. And so I wanted to talk about cases for which it doesn't. So this is not me poo-pooing that idea. Um, I just I just think that it's worth thinking about. And I also, to be fair, really like this idea that y'all are coming up with right now about the pair production opacity work, right? So I think it's worth thinking about um, and continuing to make complicated because clearly I'm for that. Um, so yeah, for sure, it's, it's a re relevant emission. So to what extent, if ever, does uh, reverberation mapping work in blazars? Uh, you've, got, you've got continuum changes, and you ought to be able to see the time delay 
BLR changes. Yes, so it's hard to do. It's hard to do. Because the jet is such a bright system. Yeah, it's hard to do because you're... But if you know of a system, I mean, take a system where you're yeah. not really so much on axis, yes. it presumably would work. It Has does. Anybody looked at this? It does work. People have tried, I mean, as you know, people have done a bunch of reverberation mapping stuff, right? So it does work, but the problem is you can you can increase, well, let's say decrease, you start with a um, very far off axis and you move through looking at all those different sources and you could do that whole thing, but still, once you get to lasers, you can't confirm or deny. Now, the implications of reverberation mapping, that is to say a relationship between the spatial extent of the BLR and its luminosity, those things scale. So we assume that it must also be true that if you could get good enough data, you could somehow tease out you know, the relationship. Uh, so we do still assume that. So I think it's relevant, it's just hard to actually carry out. But I think, oh. oh. I'm just wondering about the, uh, the sources, right? Yeah. Because there seem to be these rock stars to play yeah. much, right? Which I've been hearing about since I was a baby. Like, are there the kind of the also rams, which are like, you know, I always wonder what something looks like when you're just on the edge of the of the jet. It seems like it's all one or all another. Yeah. Always, I, don't, I don't recall seeing an intermediate. Did I miss something? So there is, there is an actually pretty steep relationship between, like, um, jet angle and um, beaming factor, right? Like. It's a pretty steep curve, so you don't expect to spend to have a lot of sources that are like right on the edge. You sort of they're very bright or they're not so bright, right? That's just the functional form. Um, but it is true that you could maybe you could think of it in the other way that like there are sources that might have been bright before that aren't right now, so it's the same functionally the same jet, but they're just not active for whatever reason. So three C four four, which is a superstar now, was not a superstar in the Libra era. Right, so if you look at it from that perspective, then you could try to think about why that is. Um, I would never say anything about duty cycles or periodicity at all because I want my job. Um, but you could consider, you could consider like what it means that a source is turning on or off. Maybe it's the it could have been a sensitivity issue, but whatever. Like I didn't, I don't know which kind of jet on you meant, but I think they have two separate answers. But the other thing I was thinking about is how if you're um, if you're willing to look at large populations of lasers, then you should be able to, in some cases, deal with the latter case, that is to say sources that haven't been very bright lately, um, that haven't bright in the past. Um, and then the other edge case that I think would be interesting is um, narrow, gamma loud narrow, narrow line secret galaxies, right? Because no one expected to see those in gamma rays, and yet we have now a handful of them that exist. Uh, and so then the question is, Okay, so you have, you have to have a relativistic jet. Is it the same on axis, but it's, some, it's in a completely different host galaxy? It's got a completely different black hole mass. Like, so I think you'd have to expand your definition of what you want to be observing, but maybe those cases exist, but it, they do fall off. Yeah, go ahead. Is there any spatial or temporal corporate, uh, correlation between phenomena on either side of the the galaxy, the jets on either side of the galaxy? So the, I talked about it as the blazar advantage because we're looking at the jet that's in our direction, but in point of fact, there's a blazar disadvantage in the sense that the counter jet is Doppler de-boosted away from you. So you really can't do that sort of analysis of what the, the forward and backward jet are uh, because special relativity gives and it takes away. Yeah, I guess. Uh, great talk to you. Um, your plot, uh, the color uh, uh, J92, uh, have you thought about in terms of trying to follow uh, the phenomenology that's happening, mm -hmm. uh, projecting it into uh, color color space, so four dimensions, and thinking about it specifically in terms of the, the plots you showed before, mm -hmm. looking at uh, specific parts of the, the color space and, and the frequency space in terms of variability uh, in the color, whether or not there's uh, interesting correlations there that may sort themselves out? Mm. Mm, that's a good question. So I will answer a similar question um, first, and that is to say that like there's been a lot of work with the teams here that have done like wise color color diagrams of blazars, and there is in fact a blazar strip in wise color color space, um, but wise isn't a time variable instrument, right? So you sort of get your 
um, your data points and however many you had skew epics, right? Yeah, actually, Wise did scan the sky multiple times, so. How many multiple? <laughs> yeah, depends on the place. It's so I was the author. Um, Hello. Also the <laughs> papers on this. It depends on the place on the sky. Okay. But anyway, we check for uh, time dependence yeah. in the color, color yeah. pattern that we found, and we couldn't see anything really significant. Are you rough, Anthony? I am. Hi! Nice to meet you. So, I'm glad that I have them. Uh, no, but seriously, like, you can see a blazar ship when you look at color, color space. So, it is something that's where you get very important information. Um, going back to answering for us, we actually were trying to do it all the way down the K-band to see, because we had an early paper that, that actually showed a little bit of a light uptick when the jet was first turning on, as so we thought we'd, like, watch K, then J, you know, like, watch... But K is just a very challenging band. <laughs> um, and so we couldn't do it as well, which would have, for me, been the best next band to try. Um, in the same way that for their color colors, they had sort of wide um, color space. Hey, when you're talking about the uh, area, you know, apples, apples, the power of the jet and the scopes. Uh, and you just talk about this, this sort of laser strip mm -hmm. uh, you know, think about ways in which you can sort of come up with a sort of specific uh, 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 laser power that, that mm -hmm. sort of, you know, uh, normalizes for the, the host versus its jet mm -hmm. so that you can actually pick apart uh, the phenomenology of the actual environments in which those jets are interacting with it. Yes, so I can't, so mostly you don't see the host galaxy of blazars very often, they're just completely swamped. Um, but I am trying to think of self-consistent ways to do that with the disk, because for me, that's what's my content. It's not contamination, but you know I mean? that's, what, that's the piece that I'm interested in trying to understand. So I, I think you're right that there, we have some more thinking to do about it. And in fact, the sort of 30 or 40 or 50 sources for which I've done this color variability um, analysis on, none of them have as complicated uh, hysteresis, for lack of a better word, than this one does. And in fact, I think that's why the Toffee Richard and their new model is interesting because there's clearly something going on with 3C279 that is not the same. Although I do have sources that do have breaks, so I do think they're going through that transition um, of disk to jet, but I'm not sure um, why this one is so complicated. The other thing is maybe you could do it backwards, that is to say, one of the sources for which you have color variability that's redder and brighter and then immediately goes into blue and brighter, maybe you could make an estimate on what the disk luminosity would have to be if you think you understand the jet. So maybe you could go that way. Um, so that's something to consider. All right, well, if there are no further questions, then please hold your peace forever. But before that, let's <laughs> give <laughs>